Hi, welcome to another video and in this video we will be talking about two other usefulness uh, uh, of using relative response factor when it comes to FID and more basics. So before we get started, please subscribe to my channel. I thanks for your support. All right, so uh, before we get into those two points, uh, I need to uh, remind you of this formula again. Uh, F when it comes to more and on the FID is defined as N ref divided by NI, right? So keep this in mind, All right? So uh, the last video I was talking about how to use this relative response factor to verify whether the instrument or the standard is doing okay. In this uh, video, I'm going to share two more uh, very good points of using relative response factor. The first one is uh, if we have an unknown compound, uh, not, not saying unknown, we, we know that something is inside, uh, in, inside our sample, but for some reason we could not find a standard that has that compound inside the standard. So we have no idea how to uh, quantify it, right? So in this video, I'm going to show you how. So let's get into S7 and I'll show you that. Okay, so let's assume that uh, this is, uh, uh, these are the compounds that you want to analyze for your sample, right? But for some reason, when you buy the calibration, uh, the supplier could not could not blend in isobutan and isopentane. This is just a sample, right? So you, you, you don't need to think of as a real situation, but uh, just make it an example. Let's say you, the supplier could not uh, blend in isobutane and isobutane in, in, the, in the calibration standard, right? So, but they, they are able to put in methane, ethane, propane, and butane, and pentane, and hexane, something like that, okay, inside the care plan. So, so the point is, but when you run your sample, your sample does have isobutane and isopentane inside. So the point is, how do you, uh, how would you uh, quantify isobutane and isopentane without having the real response factor of isobutane and isopentane, right? Because they are not present in your calibration plan, right? So, so if you put in uh, your, uh, yourself inside that uh, scenario, you can think something like, uh, uh, okay, because your COA is everything inside percent more and you know for percent more you have this behavior on the FID, right? We know that this behavior is true for for, for this uh, particular condition for on the FID and more basics. So we can apply this one to come up with this uh, response factor. We can use this one to uh, calculate a response factor of whatever unknown we have. So let's say in this case, I see we tend to one we do have, which is this one we need to calculate. And NREF is something we know, NI is something we know, and RF ref is something we know. So we basically can calculate RF very easily, right? So let me show you that. Okay, so in this case, we need to have uh, the value for the experimental response factor for IC in order for us to use this in, the, in our calculation, right? So, one of the easiest way you can think about is actually you just need to copy the value from NB10 for ICV10, but let's put into a generic way that uh, the two compounds are very different in the uh, molecular structures and that you can simply copy the number over, something like that. So let's, let's put it us inside a more generic situation, right? Okay, so, so in this case, let's say we are still sticking to propane as a reference. And in this case, we have the relative response factor for, for, for ICV10. We can perform that calculation e easily. It's, it's just three divided by four, right? So cover number of the reference divided by the cover number of the compounds that we want to uh, calculate the RF. So that's, we are getting 0 0.7.54, uh, 0.75. Okay, so because you know the RF and you know the response factor of the reference. So the experimental, the R f of the unknown that's very easy it's just a response factor over here of the reference time the uh, theoretical rf value over here that's all that's how you get this number and, and you can see these two number are pretty close as well so we are we should be good with that one the same thing for this uh, column for isopentane again if it's isopentane and pentane and n pentane you can just simply copy the value from n pentane over but let's put uh, put us inside a norm more generic situation so that would be response factor factor of the reference time the relative response factor theoretical value over here right there you go so you get this number and you get you see these two numbers actually quite close to each other right so that's the way how you can estimate the response factor for those unknown compounds that you have 
no way to purchase a calibration standard or thing like that. And in fact, this is a very common way in a lot of ASTM UOPG game method that we've been, uh, many, many suppliers, many, many manufacturers have been doing like this. So you should be good to use this and uh, this so-called technique to perform this uh, RF calculation as well, right? So once you know that I have this very simple that uh, you'll be able to calculate the concentration in your sample when you run this when you run it with when you run a sample then you get some error counts over here uh, something like let's say it's, you get two uh, five euro something like that I get any output any number 500 for example and then the concentration uh, is not COA value it's just concentration will be the error counts times the uh, F like this that's, that's how you end up with uh, copy the formula down here that's how you end up with the concentration very easily right so this is one of the uh, uh, points that's very useful when it comes to relative response factor. So you can use this one to estimate the unknown RF of a certain compound, right? All right, so let me show you one more in this video, which is the last one. And that will be to estimate the concentration of each individual compound by normalization without calibration. Okay, so we don't need to even perform the calibration. We still be able to estimate concentration of its individual compounds. So let me show you how by that. Okay. Okay, so let's put us inside this. Uh, so typically, when you run a sample, you have the error counts that look like this. And then you need to have right, experimental RF, right, in order for you to come up with, uh, the, with the concentration over here. So that's basically, let, let me copy the value on top here. Uh, let me copy this. Now, let me copy. Uh, Paste them down here. Okay, so if you have the error counts, you have the response factor, then it's very simple that you can come up with this uh, uh, these two time together, and then you should get the concentration down here. And in this case, you get like this, and the total is showing ninety nine point seventy eight percent. So that's more or less hundred percent. All right. So let's put us inside a situation that your sample only has these eight compounds. There's uh, nothing else in your sample. So that means these A's compound uh, added up to 100%, right? Or in this case, you will see 99.78%. That's very close to 100%. So let's assume that we have only these A's compound in the, sam in the sample. So that's 100%. Or whatever number that you think this A's compound should add it up to. So sometimes, let's say your sample may have another 1% of whatever inside then this H compound only add up to 99% that's just matter as long as you know the number you should be able to use this uh, uh, technique over here so how how could we do this one uh, without even knowing this uh, column okay so let's assume that let's assume that you don't even have any of this number how do we calculate the concentration all right so let's let, let me show you how actually even you don't have the experimental RF, you do have the theoretical RF as we can create the above over here. If you have not, if you have no idea why we have this number, you can watch back my uh, last couple of videos to understand why we come up with this number over here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna copy this number and I'm gonna throw the notes number down here. All right. Okay, so I have the theoretical RF over here. It's not an experimental RF, it's a theoretical value, right? I have the error count, so that's we, if I take the error count times the theoretical RF, I'm getting theoretical more percent. But these are the values that are not normalized. I put unnormalized over here, because if I add up, uh, uh, let me put this sum over here, this would be a huge number. It's like 20, 25 million, something like that, percents, that's insane, right? So that's that's not true. So this is a wrong number, right? But because we know everything here should be normalized back to 100%. So I, well, that's what I can do in the next step. I can normalize all of this. That's this one, normalize to 100%. Or whatever number you you know that your this uh, six compound should add it up to. So, so let's say 99% or 90%, whatever number you just put in here, instead of 100, right? And divide by the total of these, six, these eight compounds over here. And I'm gonna drag the formula down. So I'm gonna lock this uh, row 33, right? I'm gonna, so this is the way how I get the value. Without, you see that I don't even use this value over here, the experimental RF here. I still uh, be able to come up with this so-called uh, normalized values like this 
okay and so let's let uh, assess whether this number are they correct or are they comparable to the real numbers over here right so let's make the difference between these two so that's we this one minus this one all right let's stop here and then see how much the difference in percentage so that we difference divide by the this number over here all right so let me make it one decimal place here. all right so what you can see from here the difference between the theoretical value and experimental value is very very low which is only a few percentage over here and that is actually very very good so so you can see that you even without knowing the experimental rf you still be able to calculate the concentration of the sample of every individual compound in your sample easily using the theoretical rf over here provided they have to be added up to a certain number which is 100 percent in, in my calculation right here and this is actually one of the way a lot of methods are using this you know this technique as well and because uh, with that way you don't need to perform any calibration at all you see that you don't need this experimental rf so that's mean you don't need to do any calibration at all so that's a very useful way for you to use this uh, rf right okay so i think that's all for this video that i have for you so i'm showing you two uh very good points of using rf and uh, in the last video i did show you another one so those are the three very useful uh points that you can be using when it comes to rf and uh rare to respond factor right all right so thank you very much for watching and i hope you enjoyed this video so let me know in the comments if you have any questions for the last couple of videos about rf and I will see you in my next video. Uh, thank you very much for watching and do subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Bye-bye.